Hi, my name is Paul and I want to talk about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from death. In fact, did you know that the resurrected Jesus actually, after his resurrection, taught about his own resurrection from the Psalms, the Old Testament? In fact, in Luke 24, uh, we read these words. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me. In the Law of Moses, that's the first five books of the Old Testament. In the Prophets, that would be the Nevi'im, the, the, the prophetic writings. And the Book of Psalms, the, which would be the Kutuvim, the, the first book in, in the writings. And so all, all three parts of the Bible refer to Jesus Christ prophetically. And that's what Jesus is saying. And this is after the resurrection in Luke 24. And, uh, and then it says that he opened their minds that they could understand the scriptures. And I'm hoping, however uh, imperfect uh, a, a servant of Christ I am, I'm hoping that perhaps I can do a little bit about helping you to understand how the Old Testament actually uh, prophesies the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, it certainly prophesies his death, but, but not only his death, but also his resurrection. In fact, earlier in Luke 24, he met two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and it says that their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Uh, why would that be the case? Uh, well, when you read on, you learn that he opened, he, he said, was it not necessary that the Messiah suffer these things and, and uh, be uh, crucified and so on, and, and also to, to uh, uh, overcome uh, the, the uh, uh, assault of uh, the crucifixion and to be raised on the third day? Uh, from the dead. He had pr prophesied before he was crucified that he'd be raised again on the third day. And uh, after he opened the scriptures to their understanding, they said, we're not our hearts burning within us, as he explained, as he opened the scriptures. And it's the same scriptures that we can open. And so I want to try to help you, er, imperfectly to be sure, uh, to understand how uh, Psalm 16, for example, uh, applies to Jesus Christ. Often when we read the Psalms, we put ourselves in the center you know, we'll read the word I or my or mine or whatever. Uh, but I, w I encourage you to, to read them as being prophecies of Jesus Christ. They have application to you if you're in Christ. But, uh, but the preem preem uh, preeminent focus, as we'll see, is Jesus Christ. In Psalm uh, 16, verse 1, we read uh, these words. Uh, Keep me safe. Think of Jesus. Keep me safe, O God, for you... Uh, I take refuge, for in you I take refuge. Uh, continuing, I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. Jesus couldn't rely even on his disciples. You remember, they, he asked three of his closest disciples to watch for him, but, but they went to sleep. And he said, could you not even wait? The only, the only uh, person that was the refuge for Jesus was his Father in heaven. And he prayed, uh, as it were, great drops of blood. But he nevertheless communicated with his father. He couldn't rely on his disciples. And then in verse 3 of, of uh, Psalm 16 it says, As for the saints, or the holy ones uh, in the land, they are the glorious one in whom is all my delight. Now, probably it is not the case that all your delight of God's people on the earth, but it was the case for Jesus. In fact, in John 17, verse 24, uh, Jesus praying to the Father said, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, that they may see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Jesus wants his saints, his followers, his believers to be with him. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And, and, uh, and that's what Psalm 16 verse 3 says. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. You can't say that. And probably David couldn't say it, but the Messiah, Jesus, could say it. And this was written 900 years before, prophetically. But let us, uh, let me read more of Psalm 16, but through the mouth of Peter. You see, on the day of Pentecost, uh, Peter, was, Peter was explaining to the people what was happening with the coming of the Holy Spirit and so on. And Peter, in addition to Jesus, Je Jesus is not the only one who referred to himself uh, as being fulfilled in the Psalms. Peter it was saying the same thing. So I want to read a little bit of what Peter uh, said on the day of Pentecost. He said, 
Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead. Now listen. Freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David, referring to Psalm 16 now, David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. He's quoting Psalm 16 near the end, verse 8 and following, I think. Uh, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad. The heart of Jesus is glad. And my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave. Jesus went to the grave. He was buried, but he wasn't abandoned in the grave because the Father was going to raise him on the third day, and he did. Uh, and that's the hope. This is written 900 years before. And, and, and Peter here, quoting from Psalm 16, I'm continuing, it says, Nor will you let your Holy One see decay. Lazarus, he was in the tomb for four days, and he began to stink. But, but uh, Jesus was in the tomb for uh, three days. Uh, Friday, Saturday, and uh, actually less than three days, because it was Sunday morning at the crack of dawn that Jesus was raised. So he did not uh, see decay. Uh, and then it continues, it ends at Psalm 16. You have made known to me the paths, paths of life. You see, after his death, he was going to be raised again. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Jesus uh, is at the right hand of the Father, given the name that is above every name. And, and uh, Christians who die are going to be with Christ. And there is a day coming when everybody who has ever died in Christ will be raised bodily and will be with with Christ forever in heaven. It's a tremendous hope. A tremendous, it's not just an idle hope either. It's based on the resurrection, the death and resurrection and the promises and God's word all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Hundreds of prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. But Peter continued, he said, Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was, and was buried. What Peter is saying, David wasn't really writing about himself. He's, he's dead. He's been dead for centuries. But then uh, he says, and his tomb, Peter is saying, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would take place one of his descendants on his throne. Jesus, of course, is a descendant of David. Uh, Bethlehem is the city of David. That he was not abandoned to the grave. Jesus wasn't abandoned to the grave. Nor did his body see declare, God has raised this Jesus to life. And we are all witnesses of the fact, exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you see uh, and hear. This is the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. He promised his disciples that he would not leave them comfortless, that he would come to them in the person of the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all of them are involved in this wonderful account of salvation. But it's not only Jesus that preached from the Psalms, uh, the resurrected Jesus, who, who, who uh, after his resurrection, uh, referred to things being fulfilled about him in the Psalms and so on. And not only Peter, uh, the Apostle Peter, but also the Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 13 we read, Brothers, children of Abraham, and you God-fearing Gentiles. So this is a message for Jews and Gentiles, everybody. Uh, that's essentially like saying this is for Jews and non-Jews. Everybody's in one of those two categories. It is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem, their rulers, did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When, he, when they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. Now listen. And for many days he was seen by those who traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you uh, the good news. What God promised our fathers, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written, now he's referring to the Psalms. And in this case it's Psalm 2, verse 7. As it is written in the second Psalm, You are my son, today I have become your father. Now, notice a little further down, uh, Paul uh, is quoting from Psalm 16, just like Peter had done. So it is stated elsewhere 
You will not let your Holy One, that's a reference to Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Holy One. You will not let your Holy One see decay. For when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his fathers and his body decayed. So there Paul is saying the same thing. Psalm 16 isn't about David, even though David wrote Psalm 16. And it's not about you, really. It's about the Messiah. That's why when you read the Psalms and you, and you read some of those imprecatory Psalms, you say, wait, wait, I don't know, this is, I don't know how to do this. But it is very appropriate for Jesus, who is the judge, to, uh, for those passages that speak about judgment against sin and so on, to, to, to be given, to apply to Jesus Christ. Uh, so, and then Paul says, therefore, my brothers, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you through him everyone who believes is justified from everything you could not be justified from in the law of Moses you see you need to be justified and to be justified you need to be righteous and we all flunk we all fail now I have a little coat on and I could take it off symbolic of of maybe sin that we all have and that's what happened at the cross taking off the jacket the coat, the, the, the cloak of sin, as it were. And, and putting it on Christ. And that's exactly, he, be, he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. He took our sin on the cross. But you say, well, but how do I get, how do I get something over my shoulders? How am I, other than being naked? Uh, you know, I need righteousness before I'm justified. And the only righteousness, your righteousness won't work. Your righteousness is like filthy rags. It's trash. You won't be able to get into heaven because you think you're pretty good. You could, you've got to be perfect. And you're, you know that you're not perfect. But Jesus was and is perfect. And if you have on the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ, then you have perfection on. And when you approach heaven's gate, the, the, the gates will almost break off their hinges because of the worthy, worthiness not of you, but of Jesus Christ. And if you're clothed in Him, then you have the righteousness of God, the garment of salvation. You need to be clothed in the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul uh, in the New Testament spoke over and over again about those who are in Christ. You've got to be inside Christ. You've got to be in Him. You've got to be clothed in His righteousness. Uh, and, and if you're in Him, then you have life. If you're not in Him, you don't have life. That's, that's the way it is. That's the wonderful, it's free. It wasn't free for Jesus. He had to suffer terribly on the cross. He had to experience death and rejection from the Father, which is something that we can't even imagine. But it's a gift for us. But as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become children of God. You receive Jesus Christ. You take on his righteousness, and, and you have what you need to get into heaven. And we need to praise Jesus for coming to this world, praise the Father for sending him, and we just need to love Him and live for Him the rest of our lives. And He needs to be our Lord. There's no other hope. There's no other religious leader that has ever conquered death. Jesus is the only one. And He's the only hope. And we need Him. And may His name be praised.